And I'm telling you, if you had traded this today, you could have been really happy or you could have been really pissed. But all at the same time, the market's done hardly nothing. It's 18 basis points off from yesterday's close. Good afternoon, outliers. How are y'all doing today? Happy Fed Day. Happy Wednesday. Hope your day is going pretty well. I tell you what, um, there are people who love to trade Fed announcements. There are people whose entire careers is made on sitting and waiting on these Fed announcements. In fact, I feel like in one of the Market Wizard books, um, in one of the Market Wizard books, I swear that there was a guy whose entire trading strategy was like eight times a year, whatever the case is, for these Fed announcements. And I'm telling you, if you had traded this today, you could have been really happy or you could have been really pissed. But all at the same time, the market's done hardly nothing. It's 18 basis points off from yesterday's close. But let's look at the intraday chart, why don't we? Uh, not much going on. And then kershmash, all the volume comes through. And it goes way up and then back down. And then sideways basically since then. So yeah, if you were able to play this one minute candle up and then this one minute candle down, dude. You could have you could have made a killing. Uh, I, however, am not one of those people. So let me know if you did. I'm actually really curious to see how that went today. Dave, good to see you. Wes, glad you made it. Hey, nice profile picture. Sebastian, good to see you. Michael's here. Cam, hey everyone. Is Chris listening to the Fed interview? No, of course not. Of course not. Dave says, I almost bought Zillow right before the announcement. Would have had 100% profit in 30 minutes. Hey, Goran. Is that true, Dave? Let's take a look at, at Zillow real quick. I know that was on our buy list for the day. Oh, yeah. Zillow did spike, didn't it? Yeah, for sure. Look at that move in Zillow. Zillow is up almost 5% right now. That was one of our... Uh, picks this morning here in outlier so thank you dave for pointing that out that was definitely for sure in the right spot let's let that load in real quick john louise here dave says yes went from three to six dollars on the 62 strike oh gotcha 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 let's pop this open there are 63 new names on the bull list today by the way Uh, man, there's so many names. Hang on. Oh, my goodness. These are all today. There's a right there. Yeah, that came through today. Very cool. All right. So um, let's do jump in real quick and listen to what the, the Fed announcement was about. So after eight consecutive meetings, there is a half a point cut on the interest rates from the Federal Reserve. They say in light of inflation progress, as well as the balance of risks. Now, the decision was not unanimous. Uh, the Board of Governor Michelle Bowman voting against it, saying that she believed a 25 basis point cut is the way they should have gone. Now, the Federal Reserve signaled two more rate cuts for this year if they go by 25 basis points. That makes a full percent down by the end of 2024. But the dot plot shows the Federal Reserve was one vote away way from only one more rate cut this year. These votes are very close here. And then they're forecasting four cuts in 2025 if they go by 25 basis points. Again, one vote away from three cuts in 2025, two rate cuts in 2026, and zero in 2027. Now, the Federal Reserve members, they see uh, the numbers on unemployment ticking up slightly to 4.4 percent by the end of this year, holding steady at 4.4 percent through next year and then dropping in 2026 to 4.3. 4.2% in 2027. Now, this Fed sees inflation slightly uh, falling, finishing around the year, the PCE inflation, about 2.3%, and continuing to fall to the 2% target by the end of 2026. The core inflation, the one the Fed Reserve Chairman says that he watches, the Fed sees that dropping to 2.6% this year, 2.2% next year, and hitting the 2% target in 2026. Now, in this statement, the Federal Reserve says that economic activity expanded at a solid pace. Now, 
one change in the language about inflation, saying that inflation gains have slowed. The statement saying that inflation made further progress towards the 2% uh, objective and remains somewhat elevated. Now, Fed members have uh, greater confidence, they say, that inflation is moving substantially to the 2% target and the risk to achieving employment and inflation goals are roughly in balance. So again, the Federal Reserve seeing GDP at 2% this year through 2027. Uh, Charles, half a percent uh, surprised many people in the room in the lockup, but that is what the Federal Reserve did with one dissenter, Michelle Bowman, Board of mm, Governors. Wow, wow. All right, so we got a half half a percent cut, uh, a 50 basis point cut with the expectation of inflation slowing down. Well, I tell you what, I hope inflation slows down. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering how much of this is political maneuvering, right? I'm wondering just how much of this is Kamala struggling in the polls. Let's, let's shrug this down as far as we possibly can and, uh, see if we can make any difference. I don't know, right? The fed is supposed to be impartial, but there's no human that's impartial, especially with a election as contentious as this is. Um, but I would just really hope to see some disinflation, some deflation going on right now. Um, I know one of one of uh, Trump's things. I saw him uh, giving a speech the other day, and in the background it said, "You know, make America great again, uh, make housing affordable again, and things like that." And you got a lot of people who um, are sitting in their homes, like mine. Mine has more than doubled since I I purchased it in 2016, and I don't know if you're going to have a whole bunch of people who are saying, "You know what? My house that was half a million dollars is now a million dollars." I'm not ready to give up that um, five hundred thousand dollars of uh, of inflation. Basically, that's happened of the market appreciation. Um, so I am wondering if that is going to factor uh, in into some people's votes. I really don't know. I don't know, but that is something that's been on my mind. Um, I only today, which blows my mind, how I didn't know about this sooner. I only today found out about this really neat tool called the CME Fed Watch tool. Have you ever used this? Let me know if you have, because I, I cannot believe I didn't know about this sooner. Um, Randy says, crazy to cut 50 basis points. He was expecting 25. Uh, oh no, this went away. I wonder if it's because the rate, or if it, the news just came out. Oh, it must have. Good thing I took a screenshot. Good thing I took a screenshot. Check this out. So let me see if I can zoom out just slightly. Yeah. So this is what it looked like earlier. If you go to that link I dropped in the Discord, uh, you'll see up in the right-hand corner, it'll say, in fact, let me make this as big as possible. Up in the right-hand corner, it'll say the probabilities of a rate hike, no change, or an ease based on the meeting, right? So um, I, I guess this is updating in real time as we speak, um, and they'll be back later on. But you see the current rate, uh, you just use the lower number, uh, five and a quarter. They were expecting it to go down to five, so a 25 basis point cut by 41 percentage points. There was a 100% chance of a, of, a, of a rate cut. And there was a 59% chance of it going down 50 basis points. So I found that really cool. And I will definitely be using that in the future. Um, but yeah, there you go, 50 basis point cut. Randy says, markets didn't move much past the first five minute candle. Yeah, exactly. Markets, they don't really care. It's up 35 basis points right now, but still this is this is a tame move. Very, very tame move. You know what's not so tame? The market analysis. Okay, welcome to the Outlier Trading Room. This is smart trading made simple. Save time, make money, start winning with less risk. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christopher Ewell. I've top, I have twice been awarded top 100 people in finance. I've been successfully trading since 2009. I am a partner with Outlier, and this is my style of trading using the Outlier data. I call it the golden ticket trading strategy. So real quick, how does Outlier work? It's a four-step process. Outlier monitors how investors are reacting to changing market conditions, news, price movements, and the economy. Outlier determines if investors are acting irrationally fearful or greedy and by how much. Outlier gives buy and sell signals when these irrational behaviors reach an extreme, allowing you to get into the stock before the outlier move happens. So let's go to today's member highlight real quick. All right, member highlight of the day. Um, JW and Max were asking about uh, some other stocks that um, we don't cover. However, 
in the near future, I'm sure they will be covered. Uh, we've got about um, about 2,000 stocks here inside of Outlier, and more being added um, on a pretty frequent basis. Uh, mir- miraculous, that's right. Looking back at the live stream, Mahesh's live stream earlier today, will there be a point where Outlier incorporates external factors like rate cuts into the buy and sell signals? I would venture to say that that's already baked into these uh, buy and sell signals. Um, granted, right, we don't necessarily have uh, this level of data. Let's go like to the one minute chart, right? We don't we don't provide signals on you know one minute data. However, I would venture to say that based on how Outlier works, that we already do have um, we already do have the external factors like that already baked in. And then Dave did share a big win for him. He had been trading Lunar for a while. And Lunar just finally caught the rocket ship. Let's go take a look at Lunar real quick. And let's go to the daily. Look at that. Lunar hit the rocket ship, right? Had been around $3 or so for a while. And then over the last couple of weeks, it had been around $5. And boom, hit the rocket ship today. Uh, Up around $8 right now. And this is unfortunately one that we don't cover in Outlier. So we didn't have a buy or sell signal, but way to go, Dave, in finding that one. Uh, and Tug is here. Glad you made it, Tug. All right. So with that out of the way, don't forget to be sure to share your stories in the Discord. We want to make sure that uh, we're helping you as as best we can in every possible way. And don't forget, the first rule of Outlier is you tell everyone about Outlier and you hit the like button down below because that lets YouTube know that they should share this out to more people. Uh, So With the golden ticket trading strategy, we're going to let the market tell us which direction it's going. With the 10 over the 20, price over the 50, that makes a bullish trend. Let's go back to the SPY. That is exactly what we have here. 10, 20, 50, all that is pointing up. So for sure, this is a bullish trend right now. We did set new all-time highs on the SPY today. Let's even make a note. All, all All-time highs set today. So we'll see if that continues on. The trend is definitely looking bullish right now. The second step is to look at the breadth. And like I said earlier, we had 60 something names, 63 names on the bull list today. So if you take a look at the market breadth, you can see we absolutely got that crossover today. So the market breadth is looking bullish. So when we get back to the master key, we've got the market trend is bullish. The market breadth is bullish, but we still are sitting on a sell signal on the SPY. We still are sitting on a sell signal today on the SPY. Now, I would also like to point out that sell signals inside of an uptrend is a sell to cash signal, not a sell to go short type of signal. So because of that, uh, this does not fit my master key criteria in order to continue on, continue forward. But I want to deliver you as much value as possible. So we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about why before putting on any new trades, I always look to reduce risk. The number one thing you should do every day is not look for new trades. The number one thing you should do every day is look to reduce risk, right? Not not look to add on risk if you don't have to. Where can I reduce risk, right? And so you do that by a few key things here. And so let's spend spend a while um, on this education section here. There was a couple questions asked in the Discord that I saved. So I wanna, I wanna add those in. I guess these were... Oh, all right, hit the, hit the sneeze button so I didn't blow out your eardrums. All right, so KH Chan, or KX Chan asked, could you guide us on how to place a stop loss order for options trading? I understand from a live video is to cut losses when price blows, or price falls below half an ATR. However, I'm concerned that a sudden dip and price could trigger the stop loss order, preventing us from losing everything in the event of a sharp drop. I set my stops, oh, oh, let me rephrase that. I don't set my stops in the market. I don't set my stops anywhere. My stops are under my control. Now, there are many, many times where the market will widen out in a way that that you're not expecting. So let's say, for example, that, um, let's say, for example, you set your, trade to close let's say let's say you bought an option at a dollar let's say you put in your uh order in the market right a, a resting order to close it at 80 cents right a 20 percent loss that sucks but at the same time it's better than zero right 
So you put in your market order or you put in your, your closing order at 80 cents. And throughout the day, maybe the price goes up from a price of the option goes from a dollar to a dollar 10 back down to 90 cents. You know, it's got some fluctuation here or there. Then at the end of the day, and we've seen this at the end of the day, the spreads widen out. And then it now is from like the bid ass spread. Maybe it was from 95 cents to a dollar five. Maybe that spread now went from a 10 cent spread to like a 50 cent spread. And your order just got triggered. Right? Nothing happened other than the option price widened out at the end of the day. Nothing happened. Or maybe the 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 VIX expanded, right? But your stock wasn't impacted. Nothing at all happened. But yet the bid ask spread widened and you just got taken out. You just took a 20% loss. That sucks. I've been there. That's why I don't do that. Right now, if you elect to take off your trades by watching them yourself, like I do, you need to watch them, right? You, you, you can't rely on, uh, you know, just everything's going to work out, right? You, if you're not going to put in a stop in the market, you must take the responsibility of your own money and to say, okay, if this happens, I'm going to get out. If that happens, I'm going to stay in. And so for me, that's why I have a very structured set of rules because I don't want to put my money on the line just to be stolen from, basically, if a uh, stop loss order was hit. So that answers that question. It was, a, it was a great question. I'm not discounting at all, but it is something you need to be aware of. Oh, look at that. I actually wrote this down. I never put a stop in the market. The biggest reason is that option prices can vary wildly. Dave mentioned uh, to me yesterday that he was seeing wide swings in the bid and ask spread on GLPI. That was cause for concern. For example, when the market opens after the close and near the close, the option prices can start to drift away from a true market price. The absolute worst case here would be getting filled when there is zero reason just because the spreads widen out like they normally do. So I personally only use the price of the stock as my trigger for exiting and the option price will be reflective of that point. I also do not put any stop losses during the day, and I've seen time and time again the half ATR get hit midday only for it to recover. In fact, I think we saw that two or three times just in the last couple of weeks when I wrote this. Uh, the real way to avoid this is by position sizing correctly, right? We've we spent a lot of time in the last few days talking about how important position sizing is, right? That is one way to not have anything go against you is by position sizing correctly. We talked specifically yesterday about how uh, you can include the ATR value on any stock and how that will allow you to size for volatility. And when you size for volatility, then you shouldn't be stressing, right? If you have size for 2% of your account, 5% of your account, right? The very worst thing that can happen is you lose 2 or 5% of your account. That sucks. No one's saying it doesn't suck, but it's a lot better than throwing everything you own into one position just hoping for the best right there's no reason to do that so the real way to avoid the issue is by position sizing correctly when you position size to a risk level you're comfortable with you won't stress like you would on big size even if it goes beyond your stop loss by having the position size limited you're already putting a stop loss in on the account level does that make sense right by not buying your a, <laughs> I just really want to make sure that you understand what I mean by by putting a stop. Uh, I'm sorry, by position sizing correctly, you're already putting a stop loss in on your account. Please let me know in the chat if that makes sense, because if I put 100% of my account in one trade. That now exposes 100% of my account to that one trade. But if I'm position sizing where I only am putting 5%, 10%, of my account in one trade, the very worst thing that can happen is I lose 5% or 10%, okay? Now, granted, I don't want that to happen to you, but by doing that, you're putting a stop loss on your account, okay? Even if it goes to zero, absolute zero, you're gonna be all right. You're gonna survive. You're gonna be able to trade more because you didn't put in your entire account in one trade. So that's why I say by putting the right position size in, you're putting the stop loss in on your account. All right, now let's go to these rules. These are rules that I follow. You do not have to follow them, okay? 
You do not absolutely have to follow them. These are my rules that I've found work really well. Nothing's perfect, but they work incredibly well. And I want to go through each one of these because this is what we do every single day when we're looking to reduce risk. Randy says, yep, let's let's roll full portfolio into a zero DTE. Yeah. There were days where I did that, Randy, way back when. Never. Wes says, accounts should never be allocated 100% in shares, much less a contract that it could expire worthless. Precisely. There you go. All right, let's break this down and we'll go top to bottom here. So if the 10 EMA is broken, remember we talked about the uh, exponential moving averages the other day and why they matter on the chart and how the 10 EMA is your short-term trend. If the 10 is crossed under, right? If price closes below here, that is an exit signal to me. That's an exit signal to me because A, price has to be over that point for me to even get in. And B, if it goes under the 10, that is the indicator that the short-term trend is changing, okay? Now granted, this one here, the first time it closed under the 10, it went down about 3% or so, and then it came right back up. There is absolutely zero guarantees in the market that this will happen. Zero guarantees that this happens. But there is a guarantee of getting out to even if it continues down, it's not gonna hurt you. In fact, I saved this. You should take a screenshot of this. If you're not doing well trading stocks, the grand majority of the problem is ego driven by fear. The problem is you. Which means the solution is also you, which is good. But the first time you have to accept responsibility and banish. Uh, but first, there we go. But first, you have to accept responsibility and banish blame. Then you become empowered with the ability to respond. OK, so let's let's break this down. Let's make it a little bit bigger. So looking at this here, right, let's imagine that you buy here, OK, and the price goes up and then it comes back down and you're like, oh, man, that sucks. It went under the 10 EMA, right? Imagine the 10 EMA is right here. In fact, let's just draw on it. Imagine our blue 10 EMA is right here. OK, and price closes below that point. There's every chance that it'll do exactly this. Every chance. And I'll come back up and then continue on, right? And you didn't sell because you were afraid that that would happen. You didn't sell because you're like, oh man, but maybe if I give it one more day. But what actually happens is this. Right? Everything we're going to be covering today is all about mastering your own fear. The fear of missing out. And it sounds like, oh, no big deal. I'm just going to follow the plan. But can you? Can you actually follow the plan? Right? I go through these rules every day. I have them written down on purpose. There was a point of time in my life where I could have had all of this written down. Planned on getting out. And yet when that actually happened, when that actually came, I still would hold on to it. I would have the world's most elaborate exit plan. And yet I would be stuck in this mode. I would be stuck in being fearful that it's going to turn around without me. I don't want to take that loss. It sucks. But then this is exactly what happened to my account. And it doesn't have to be. You never have to have this happen again. I want to repeat that. You never, ever have to have this happen again. In fact, you should never let that happen again because you should be able to take your trades off when it doesn't work out, okay? This is more of a trading psychology bit than anything else. There's no guarantee this will happen, but if it's closing under the 10 EMA, the short-term trend is down. And the short-term trend could absolutely continue on without you. Or it could continue with, with you destroying your account. Choice is yours. Next, a half ATR value from entry. We discussed yesterday how important it is to have that ATR value, right? You're sizing 
for volatility. And by having a half ATR, you're taking a small portion of risk, right? Let's let's do it as an example. Let's say I got in right now at 562.38. ATR is at 732. $3.66. I'm only going to give it $3.66 to prove if it is going to work, right? So I would take 366 minus where I got in, 558.72. I'm only going to give it $3 to prove to me, $3.66 to prove to me it's going to work. I will give it this much room. And even intraday, it can go down. But as long as it doesn't close below that point, I'll keep it on. This is my stop loss point. Period. End of story. Whatever is the least amount of risk should be your stop loss point. In fact, let's let's do that exercise real quick. Let's say that half an ATR is down here. It's not, but let's just say, for example, the 10 EMA comes first, not the half ATR. So you would exit using that. Right. We're looking for the first one of these that gets hit. So if it comes down closes under the 10 EMA, but still above your half ATR, it's still a closing signal. It's still a you get out of the way signal. Okay. So we've talked about those two. Now let's talk about order blocks. Order blocks are freaking sweet. Um, let's look at Zillow. No, 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 let's look at Lunar. Dave's big winner. Remember the other day how I went into such great detail about how important order blocks are and how amazing they are? Look at this, right? This order block will disappear today. But this order block was created in March. The first time price came up to it, it was rejected. The second time, look, on this candle, price came up to it, was rejected. The third time, rejected. The fourth time, rejected. On the fifth time, the fifth time of running into this order block, did it finally close above there, if it closes above there? And now you've got an order block up here, which I do have this. We'll cover this in a moment, which I would trade it like this. Let's add in a line right there. Let's go to the five minute chart. Look at this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to the daily chart real quick. If I am trading long and I see an order block, like let's say I'm trading down here. If I'm trading long and I see an order block, I will hesitate to put on the trade, but I'll do a couple of analysis, right? First, how much room do I have up to this order block, right? If, if I've got 10%, I'm interested, right? If I've got 10% to move up to this order block, I'm interested. But if I've got 1%, if I've got 1% up to this order block, eh, that's not worth my time, right? Let's look at somebody else real quick. We'll come back here, see if I can find another one with the order block above. Zillow works. Right? Let's say if I'm getting in here, at this candle, that wasn't what I wanted. Let's say if I'm getting in on this candle here and I see that I've got 13%, $7 to an order block, I'm very interested. Well, let's say if I get my signal here, that's 2%. It's only a dollar and a half. I'm not interested. This is this is the one thing that might be subjective, right? It really depends on, hey, how much how much room do I have? Is there enough room to make any money? If, if there's only like 1%, eh, there's no real reason to trade that. But let's go back to Lunar. And let's say you get yourself into a, a situation like Dave has, where, right, if it's running up into an order block, if it's running up into an order block, 
I might take my, my money off the table just because it's running up to the order block. But let's say I'm in an order block. I'll day trade it. This is the only time you're going to find me day trading. If a stock has an order block in the direction of the trend and it moves into that order block, which is perfect today on Lunar. If it has an order block in the way and it moves up into the order block like it did earlier today. Close at the end of the day, Dave. Or day trade the stock using a five minute chart. Now, I would wait for the 10 EMA to cross the 20 EMA. OK, so I, I gave a couple examples right here. If it runs up into the order block and doesn't cross down the 10 uh, doesn't cross under the 20, dude, by all means, hold that and let that thing go. Let it work while it's working. But if it goes up in the order block like this one, this example did, and then you have that crossover back down. That is the time to exit. So let's do this a real time view on Lunar. So this green line, this green line is the bottom of the order block. Price went up into the order block, which is shown by this. This is that same green line, okay? Now, it developed a five-minute order block. We're not going to worry about that. It went up into the order block here at around 9.30 this morning, and then came down, and then the crossover happened here at 11.45. Now, the high was, it looks like the high was 894. And if you got out here, you'd be down about 70, 70 cents from the high. Okay. But that's also about 70 cents is about halfway. Exactly. Greater than where it is right now. So that is exactly how I would trade. If it runs up into an order block, go to the five minute chart, figure out where the bottom of the order block is. And then once it crosses over, right, if it continues up, let that dude run, let it run. It could run all day and it'd be awesome. But if it crosses back down, like it did here, that's your exit signal. Now that allows it room to run, right? Like it's going to kiss all these moving averages all day long. But until the crossover happens, that's when you get out. So if it runs up into an order block, outlier heat map stalls. We talked about this the other day uh, about what the heat map is, why it's important. If you want to go back and review that, that was on how does uh, here we go. September 5th, go back to review the September 5th trading room Be because we talked about um, what constitutes all of these different indicators here. Now, for me personally, I love using the heat map as an exit signal. Now, when you look at the heat map, look up in this line right here. And you'll see it goes from like G25. You can see it down at R12. Right. What do these mean? So G values are green values. R value is red values. That's pretty easy. But G values are indicative of, of greed, right? How greedy are people getting? Red values are how fearful are people getting. So at some point, they're going to stop getting greedy. Okay. They're going to stop getting greedy and start getting fearful. They're going to stop getting greedy and start getting fearful. We can measure that. Isn't that cool? You can't find this data anywhere else. We can actually measure that. So if we go into here and we say, okay, watch this, follow along. G30, G31. G31. Okay, they're no longer getting greedier. In fact, they might start getting fearfuller. So we're G31, still G31, G30, G30 again, 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 G29. You see where I'm going with that? Is that this is the measure of fear and greed on this individual stock. And we can measure how people change here and say, people are no longer getting greedy. People are no longer excited about buying the stock. People are starting to get, get fearful. And when that change occurs, that is an exit signal. I only want to be in a stock if people are getting greedier about the stock. You know what that means? More people are buying it. More people are interested in it. More people are sharing it out on the interwebs, right? 
When there's excitement around a stock, it gets more and more greedy. But there is a termination point. When that point occurs, we can measure it, and then we get out. That is one of my very favorite ways of selling into strength, right? When we have the first instance of a lack of greed to this particular stock, cut, get out. Then lastly, close above or below the prior day's lower high. Low context here. If we're going long, if it closes below the prior day's low, okay? So let's go look at a few charts. A close below the prior day's low would be like this candle. Right? See how much lower it is than the prior day? In fact, if you want to look at it on a trend, look at this trend. How many times do you see a close below the prior day's low? Happened here. But it did not happen again this entire time. Maybe right there. Actually, right there, yeah. So that was your first indication. And then right there. And then right there. And then right there. A really strong trend doesn't have that happen. An incredibly strong trend that you want to ride, that you want to buy, that you want to watch the stock go up. You're not seeing days where price closes below the prior day's low. That signals the end of a trend, right? That happened right there, closed below the prior day's low. Four days later, another closed below the prior day's low. And then we went down 10% from that point. Pretty sweet, right? Pretty sweet. But I have found that occasionally, if I'm just getting into, into a trade, that it'll, it'll do that. And it's really frustrating because then it'll turn around and go on without you, right? So what I have found is I've made that only once it's profitable, which means the only stop loss I have on my chart, the only horizontal line on my chart that says it has to get out below here is a half ATR. Okay. If my half ATR isn't hit or the 10 EMA, if neither of those are hit, yet it closes below the prior day's low and I'm not already profitable, I'm still going to let it work because I've already established my risk. That's the key here. I've already established my risk. So I'm giving it a little bit of room to work. I'm only going to give it that half ATR is worth that $3 and change or whatever on the SPY. And then once that does hit, once that does hit either of these points on the chart, I'm out. Now, let's also talk about long and short exits, okay? I, I try and keep it really simple, right? If it's, if it's any red, if I get into any stock and it starts in the reds, like right here, like right here, let's say I got a buy signal. In fact, right there, there's a buy signal and the R4. If I get a, a, a buy signal in the R4, I would get out at G13. So let's, let's just do that, for example. So that'd be May 6th, 2024. I'll circle it on here. Here. Let's say I got in right there, okay, at the top of that candle. I'm going to let it go to G13. I'm not looking at anything else right now, just for this example. I'm going to go over, over G13 right there, May 14th. That was a great trade. Look at that. A $6 move on the SPY, 1.3%. That sounds pretty good, right? I'll take that. How easy was that, right? You get in an R, you get out at G13. Simple. Now, we go to the next step. If it's any G value up to G25, I give it a 10 point spread. Meaning, if I get a buy signal, like right here, and it's a G13 already on the buy signal, so anything 0 to 25, I give it a 10 point spread. So if it's G13, I'm going to get out of G23, right? Right there. So that looks like, let's do a real life example. January 23rd, 2024. January 23rd, 2024. Now I'm not cherry picking these. These are, these are just data points, okay? January 23rd, right there. 
let's say I get on all that buy signal. G13, I'm gonna walk it up to uh, G23 on the heat map. So doop, 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 right there. January 30th, we hit G23, okay? Watch this. A nice, beautiful, easy, $5.73, 1.2% on the SPY right before the sell-off. That's pretty cool, right? That's, that's two for two, where it's hit a short-term high and missed a sell-off. Let's see if we can make a three for three. Let's see if we can make a three for three. If it's G25 or greater, I only give it a five-point spread. Talked about this a couple days ago. When you're looking to get in on a heat map, and it gets deep in those greens or deep in those reds, right? There's only so much more opportunity there, right? G50 is the uh, top value. So if I'm already halfway there with G25, I'm not gonna give it 10 points. That puts me to G35, right? We're, we're, we're kissing up on a 50 here. But if I get it from G25 to G30, or even G40 up to G45, I'm only gonna give it a five point spread, no matter where it is above G25. So let's see if we can find an example of that. Let me catch some on the, on the chat too. Uh, Dave says that top order block goes all the way back to the moon landing. <laughs> I completely agree. It's a longer term hold for me. More than likely, there's some more catalyst coming. Cam says, hit the like button, people. I only see two likes. Thank you, Cam. I appreciate that. All right. Um, let's see where we can find a buy signal that's over G25. This one is G24, so I would still give that 10 points. This one is G1. G18. G16. G12. G24, we're close. G24 again. <laughs> Here we go. G36. August 31st of 2020. Let's go. Let's go. August 31st of 2020. Moving on back. That's practically at the moon landing, right, Dave? <laughs> August 31st of 2020. Uh... August 31st, right? Or was it? Yeah, yeah. August 31st of 2020. Let's see how well this rule works. As you can see the chart here. Let's see how well this rule works. If this if this works like I think it does, I'm going to be really stoked. All right, remember. If it's over G25, we're only giving it a five point spread. I have not checked this ahead of time. It starts at G36. G36 plus five is G3041. G36, 37, 37. Oh, it didn't hit 41. That's okay. If it had hit 41, I would have been like, let's freaking go. But it didn't. So when that happens, that's okay. Cause we got every other rule, right? We have all these other rules. So if it doesn't hit a five point spread, that's okay. We have every other reason to get out. Right? So for example, on this one, I would have got out here. Right? A 1% loss. And there's no way that you could time the very top candle like that unless it had hit G41. But it closed under the 5, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the 10 EMA. You see that, right? The 10 EMA is the blue line. It went up. Close under that, it may not have even hit my half ATR. Let's say if my half ATR was like down here, the 10 EMA took precedence over there. And then the same is true on going short. I'll save y'all time and we don't have to go through that. But uh, on on shorts, I give it a different spread. I, I did a lot of back testing on this. R uh, zero to 10, I give it 13 points. And anything over R11, so I'm not even going up to R25. I'm only I'm giving it a nine point spread. So it could be R30, I'm still giving it a nine point spread. It could be R11, I'm giving it a nine point spread. Uh, but any green 
I'll enter at R or I'll exit at R8 or a 13 point spread. It it things get different when you go short, right? Things get a lot different than when you go short. So I have built a little bit different rules. So that 13 point spread would be the same as as anything else. But if it hits R8 first, I would get out there. Let's see here. Tug says, if you hit one of your exit points, you close the position the next trading day, end of the day, the following day. No, 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 no. If it hits that point, I'm out that day, right? I'm not giving it any extra time, right? If it closes under my half ATR, I'm out. If it closes, if it closes under my my half ATR, I'm out. If it closes under the 10 EMA that day, right? And that's why we trade at the end of the day. Like this is strategic, okay? If I'm trading at the end of the day, then I'm gonna know if it's gonna close pretty close to the uh, to under one of these me me uh, measures, right? If it closes under the 10 EMA, we're gonna get pretty close. Or if it's gonna run into an order block, if it runs into an order block, I wanna know earlier on in the day. Uh, the outlier heat map stalls at the end of the day. Close below the priority is low at the end of the day. Any of these at the end of the day. I'm always working on today because today is what's gonna matter, right? Remember, Tug, I want you to drill this. I want you to get this tattooed on you. I don't know if you're a tattoo kind of guy, but if you are, take a screenshot of this, run this over to your tattoo parlor and say, do this. <laughs> Because, you know, tomorrow it could be doing this. And I don't know about you, but one of the things I struggled with was I'm going to give it tomorrow. I'll give it till tomorrow. I'll give it till tomorrow. I'll give it till tomorrow. And this is what happened. I'm not saying that was for you. I'm saying that's exactly what happened to me. I would give it another day and another day and another 50 cents and another day. Because I was afraid it would do that. But what ended up happening was blowing up my account. Wes says, thanks for explaining the slide. That's one I had some questions on, especially what you're talking about, the G13 value and the heat map. You are welcome, my friend Wes. Glad to help out. So I really hope that um, this was enlightening. Uh, the number one thing you have to do each day before you're putting on anything, before you put on a single trade, look to reduce risk. Okay, it's going to give you more capital. It'll give you more money to trade with. If you're reducing risk today and you take off a trade, guess what? You have money back in your account so you can trade more. So you can buy more of what you're looking at. Reduce risk before adding any new trades. Take off those winners. Take off those losers, right? Um, I actually made a quote. Pretty damn good quote if you ask me. Let me find it. Today is the day you take the opportunity to turn your small losses back into cash before they become big losses. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. I thought it was a pretty good quote. Pretty handsome guy right there, just saying. So that's going to wrap it for today. And listen, thank you so much for uh, being an outlier. We literally could not do this without you. And we want to pay you back every single day by helping you save time, make money, start winning with less risk. And to Tug's question, so basically the last 30 minutes of the day? Exactly. Last 30 minutes of the day. Uh, don't forget, we are going to be raising the price on the Outlier annual plan at the end of the month. I don't want you to miss out. If you haven't already got your annual pass, it's literally 82 cents a day. Uh, so it's $2.99 for the year. You don't want to miss out because, um, like I said, we will be raising the prices on that. And be sure you hit the like button, right? The first rule of Outlier is you tell everybody about Outlier. And you do that by hitting the like button. Thank you so much for coming today. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Talk soon. Mm -hmm.